and dangerous. Surfers brave its swells for a rush of adrenaline. But the water's force is not the only thing to fear. Beneath the surface, a deadly presence may be waiting to strike. Along South Africa's pristine beaches, a surfer falls victim to a savage attack by not one, but two great white sharks. Was he singled out by these deadly predators? Could he actually be a shark magnet? What are the clues? Where will the answers be found? Solving this mystery requires teams around the world that include scientists, physicians, and divers. They'll need all of their skills to unravel the mysteries they find in the deep. These seasoned detectives will reopen attack scenes and shed new light on these tragic encounters. They will reveal who is the hunter and who is the hunted. It is a July afternoon in South Africa. Yo, there's waves all over the place, eh? Just after 1 p.m., 15-year-old Shannon Ainsley heads out to catch some waves off East London's Nahoon Reef Beach. With him are his brother Brandon and a couple of friends. A natural athlete, Shannon wants to climb up the surfing circuit. He spends nearly half of every day in the ocean. All South African surfers are aware that someday they might share liquid space with sharks. Should we say a prayer? Yeah. Father God, we just want to thank you so much for The Ainsleys and their friends always say a prayer before entering the water. Keep everyone safe from getting attacked by any sharks, Lord. Let us have some good fellowship, Lord, and let us glorify you in the name of Jesus. We pray. Amen. 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 Let's go. Thanks. But on this day, something will go terribly wrong. Shannon paddles out. For about an hour, the surfers catch one tremendous wave after another. Then, the unbelievable happens. This is video of the actual event accidentally shot by someone on shore. Shannon Ainsley is attacked by two 16-foot great white sharks at the exact same time. Is this possible? The odds against being attacked by just one of these fearsome predators are astronomical. A simultaneous attack from two of them seems virtually impossible. And yet, it happened. Why would two sharks target the same person? Did Shannon unknowingly do something to make himself bait? Or is he somehow more attractive than others? We may think we know why white sharks attack humans, but do we? An attack half a world away seems to provide a textbook case. It is August on California's central coast. For years, college instructor Deborah Franzman has enjoyed the ocean near San Luis Obispo.
Bransman wears a thick wetsuit to keep warm. She has the beach and the ocean to herself at this early hour of the morning. Bransman's strong strokes send her through the light chop. Surprisingly, none of the usual sea lions are present anywhere. Could they sense a danger that Deborah Fransman does not? Soon, several local lifeguards arrive at the beach and begin training maneuvers. Fransman is about 75 yards out. In mid-stroke, she stops to adjust her goggles. Crashing blow sends her reeling. A sharp tug on her upper thigh pulls her under. Abruptly, the force releases her. Immediately, the lifeguards respond to her screams. One calls for help. Yeah, we need to get, we need to get somebody here right now. All of a sudden, all three of their hands popped up in the air. In lifeguarding, that means um, immediate assistance is requested. I gotta go. The other three reach Deborah and keep her afloat until the caller arrives. I got out to her and the other three guys were pretty much in shock. There was just a lot of blood in the water. Debra is unconscious. As the lifeguards tow her back to the safety of the beach, the extent of Debra's wounds becomes known. The laceration across both legs was really large. She's not ready. Check your pulse. A huge crescent-shaped bite arcs across her body. She's still got no pulse. There's no doubt that this was done by a shark. A shark expert analyzed the bite area, and he said that, that the shark was probably between 17 and 20 feet. Only one predatory shark gets that big. The Great White. Great white sharks are true super predators, and they rule the food chain. A fully grown great white can dwarf an average sized truck, and the shark is twice as heavy. 50 two inch long teeth are constantly being replaced, always sharp and always ready. Even the great white's skin, tough as armor, helps in the hunt. The texture traps passing water, creating an envelope that silences the hunter's torpedo-like ambush. Few creatures could withstand the fury of a full-blown assault. Deborah Fransman is dead before medical help arrives. Why had this woman been attacked? In many ways, her case seems all too familiar in its tragic details. It appears to support the theory that wetsuited swimmers and surfers, like Shannon Ainsley, are targeted because they look like the white shark's favorite prey, sea lions or seals. Could the sharks get confused? 
Deborah Fransman was wearing a black wetsuit and fins, which approximate a seal's coloring and profile. What's more, she had been swimming alone, close to a known sea lion colony, where great whites often hunt. When great white sharks hunt these marine mammals, they are surprisingly cautious. Like any predator on the hunt, even the giant sharks can get hurt, and a fully grown seal can be a formidable foe. The shark's solution is to strike from beneath and inflict a devastating wound on its prey. The predator then retreats to a safe distance while the unfortunate victim weakens or bleeds to death. Finally, the great white returns to claim and consume its meal. This might explain why the lifeguards found Deborah Fransman still floating there. But the reasons why she was attacked may not be as simple as they seem. And this popular theory that sharks may mistake people for seals does not fully explain key points of Shannon Ainsley's startling attack. There is no seal colony at the surf spot in South Africa. The sharks wouldn't come here to hunt them. And though Shannon wore a wetsuit, so did all the other surfers in the water that day. He no more resembled a seal than they did. What's more, great whites have been known to attack humans in places where seals are never found. Consider one attack that took place in the middle of the open ocean, far from any coastline that a seal might call home. One hot day in March, Heather Boswell and her colleagues jumped into the ocean from their research vessel in order to cool off. They were 300 miles from land in the South Pacific. Where we went swimming was in the middle of nowhere. There's this beautiful blue water. I kind of expected it to be a little cold, but it was really warm. It felt like bath water. Like Shannon, Heather was in the water with many others. There were probably 12 people in the water. What happened next was caught on video by one of her colleagues on the ship. One guy in the water yelled, shark. Everybody just panicking and pretty much trying to walk on water to get back. And uh, that's when the shark uh, swam around and started chewing on me. And I turn around to see what was happening. And I just see this huge dorsal fin just towering over me. It was like, I don't know, three feet tall. I tried to start swimming away, and then the shark just let go of me. Just then, a skiff that had been in the water to collect the bathers arrived beside Heather. I didn't even know that that skiff was there until they were like right in front of me. That's when the shark came back and grabbed onto my other leg and jerked me under the water. It was so powerful. It made me feel like a rag doll. I remember looking at it and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna die. <laughs> and then before I knew it, the shark brought me right back up, right beside the skiff. Two people reached down and grabbed my arms and you know, the shark clamped down to hold on and, and I felt a pop. The shark got my leg and they got me. Boswell's left leg had been severed from the hip down. She was airlifted to a mobile hospital. Doctors say it is a miracle that she survived. Experts analyzed the video and confirmed 
that the shark was a great white. But of all the people in the water, why had Heather Boswell been chosen? She wore no wetsuit or fins and was hundreds of miles from any seal colony. Some people believe that sharks may bite unfamiliar objects, including human victims, simply to find out what they are. Was Heather's attack, and perhaps Shannon's, a case of razor-sharp curiosity? There is evidence to suggest that the shark did not target Heather as prey. Its initial bite was uncertain. It didn't feel really aggressive. It just felt like, you know, when a puppy chews on your finger, inquisitive, maybe curious. But the strike on Shannon Ainsley was anything but tentative. The impact catapulted him several feet into the air. This attack was not a shark inspection. Shannon was targeted. He was hunted by not one, but two great white sharks. Why? The answers may lie hidden at the scene of the attack, the famous waves of East London's Nahoon Reef, and the discovery of clues that raise chilling questions about great whites and the targeting of Shannon Ainsley. The waters off South Africa are home to some 100 different species of shark. But only one rules. Great whites are the masters here, and the biggest lure for many humans. Here, the sharks are offered up in various ways to the public. The curious can take home a white shark token and even get safely into the water with the sharks themselves. They seem to regard the sharks without fear. There's one, one of them smiled at me earlier. <laughs> Amazing. This is a max, man. The sharks are awesome. Most along the South African coast seem happy to share their ocean with the giant sharks, so long as it's from the safety of a cage, a boat, or even shore. But many here choose to enter their realm with no more protection than a wetsuit. Some surfers in the area jokingly refer to themselves as shark biscuits. There's a reason why. Worldwide, one-third of all attacks by the great sharks are on people surfing, more than any other human activity. These adrenaline junkies are well aware of the risks. And with more than 1,000 confirmed great whites in South Africa's waters, it's no surprise that almost every surfer in East London knows of or has had an unscheduled encounter. I know three people who've been attacked. In fact, another guy, two that I know of, it's also been attacked. Yeah, a couple of guys. I was attacked, felt this like a shark come up and, and grab my, my ankle. About four years ago, I got bumped. It's just on the arm. It's a common occurrence. It happens, you know? These things happen none of them. But even these seasoned veterans of the waves were unprepared for what happened to Shannon Ainsley. How had two of these wide-ranging predators closed in on the same target at the same time when the ocean they prowl is so vast? Could the answers lie in the sea where the ambush took place? It was a clear day, very nice swell, blue water. Billy Moritz is a marine biologist, now in charge of beaches in East London. He's investigated many shark attacks on surfers. And what time of the day did it happen? Around about lunchtime. It was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Michael Scholl is also a marine biologist 
and the administrator of the White Shark Trust in South Africa. That's the reef where they surf. Shannon and his friends knew the best spot to catch the big waves, near the offshore reef that has made this beach a surfing mecca. How deep is it around there? It is not, not very deep there because of the reef. But, around, um, the reef? around the reef, it's about 10, 15 meters. Could the deeper water have meant cooler surf conditions? How cold was the water temperature when Shannon got attacked? It was on the 17th of July and it was in the region of 14 degrees Celsius. That may seem cold, but it's actually a bit warm for the winter ocean. The day before Shannon was attacked, a westerly wind blew tropical currents toward shore. And the westerly wind does warm the water up a bit. That brings in the warmer water from the deep ocean. If the wind had brought the warm water into shore, could it also have brought the sharks? Most fish are cold-blooded and are highly dependent on the surrounding ocean temperature to survive. Great white sharks, however, can recycle the heat generated by their muscles to regulate their body temperature. This allows them to hunt in all types of conditions, from the warm reefs of the tropics to the chilly fjords of Norway. Warm water alone wouldn't bring them to shore. Whatever brought them, Shannon Ainsley never saw them coming. He never saw a shark. I don't believe he ever saw the shark. Though their name comes from their ghostly white undersides, the top of the shark is countershaded. This makes them nearly invisible to their prey when they strike from the depths below. I mean, what, what happened with Shannon? Well, they were about, I think they were about 15 of them surfing. His brother had just gotten out of the water. And um, he was hit very hard from beneath by a shock. A big shock. I was flying through the air. Everybody was screaming. I just heard a commotion behind me. Uh, people were screaming, shouting, shark, shark, shark. I just I immediately thought about Shannon. I immediately thought to myself that the worst might have happened. Brandon watched the water searching for a sign that his brother had survived the onslaught. But what chance did Shannon have? Could anyone survive such a massive attack? The footage of Shannon Ainsley's attack gives no clear indication of the extent of his wounds. But the possibilities are horrifying. Just how much damage can a white shark inflict on its target? Halfway around the world, investigators consider the consequences of its fearsome design. This was an attack that occurred about eight years ago. What are the odds of someone surviving something like that? Well, it really depends on where they're bit. Typically, surfers are bitten on the lower leg and could be a grave situation since uh, a lot of the big vessels in your body are in your lower limbs. Dr. Scott Yerby is an orthopedic engineer who knows about shark bites firsthand. He was attacked by a great white while surfing off the coast of Northern California. This was my leg right here. Here's the quadriceps and here's the hand injuries. Here's a different image of that same wound. I can't believe how straight it is. The doctor actually said that these wounds were uh, cleaner than any scalpel blade he could ever perform. The key to their being able to cut through flesh and bone is having these teeth that are so sharp and you know they're rather slender. You know, it makes them almost like, you know, sort of like razor blades. Professor Greg Erickson studies the comparative bite forces of predators at Florida State University. Even though these animals are dulling their teeth, they're breaking them, they have backup teeth behind here that kind of roll out like a conveyor belt. In a lifetime, we'll go through hundreds of sets. I mean, Scott, in many ways, this thing's the ultimate killing machine. Imagine poor Shannon Ainsley 
trying to survive an attack from two of these animals. As he searched the waves, Shannon's brother feared the worst. Then, Brandon caught sight of Shannon's surfboard. The damage did little to calm his fears. Finally, Brandon saw something he could hardly believe. I noticed that a few of the surfers were getting out, and, and I saw one last surfer, it was Shannon. Miraculously, Shannon Angley emerged from the waves alive. Somehow, he had survived the attack of two great white sharks. I never knew there were two sharks at the time. I only found out two days later when I saw the video. Even more incredibly, Shannon's injuries were minor. He walked away from his confrontation with two 16-foot sharks with only lacerations on one hand. I feel so blessed because neither of the sharks came back for me and tried to attack me again. But why had they tried in the first place? Is it possible that Shannon unknowingly sent out a signal that called the predators directly to him? Great whites are armed with highly tuned senses that have pinpointed prey for millions of years. Which of them led the sharks to Shannon? Could it have been smell? Some in East London thought it was possible. Tourist dive operations along the coast all promised their clients a close-up encounter with the sharks. To do that, you need to find these rare fish in a wide open sea. But it turns out it's a lot easier to let them find you. Shark Tours spoon chum, a mixture of shark livers and fish oil into the ocean. It's usually not long before the sharks show up. They can smell the blood in the water more than a quarter mile away. Some even suggest that the predators may be attracted to more than just the chum. In addition to being the most lethal, great white sharks are also some of the most intelligent fish on the planet. Far from the mindless automatons of popular lore, they are as capable of learning and modifying their behavior as many mammals. In fact, they are the only fish anywhere that will actually raise their head out of the water to investigate the world above. Could it be that these intelligent fish are becoming habituated to chumming and are learning to associate people with food? For now, we can't be sure. But though debate still continues about the safety of this practice, both for the white sharks and for the humans that seek them, it still doesn't provide the answer to Shannon Ainsley's mysterious twinned attack. There is no chumming or shark dive tourism in East London. Fishing boats do not come close to the surfing beaches either. Besides smell, what else could have drawn the sharks to Shannon? Could sound have brought them in? Great whites, like all sharks, are incredibly sensitive to sound. Their good world carries sonic vibrations faster and farther than the air above. A small canal that runs the length of the shark's bodies beneath the skin, called the lateral line, lets them hear the sound of their prey, not only at their ears, but all along their massive lengths they can detect some sounds miles from their source. 
See the lateral line right here? There's a bunch of sensory pores along there that allow these animals to pick up those low frequency mechanical sounds of, you know, say, say a, a struggling fish. So could this pick up people playing in the ocean? Absolutely, yeah. You know, the low frequency splashing that's occurring, uh, you know, it's gonna travel very quickly through the, through the water. Such splashing may actually have been the lure that drew the shark to Deborah Fransman. The lifeguards training along the beach were certainly creating enough noise to attract the attention of a passing white shark. The predator may have been heading towards them when it came across Fransman. And what about Heather Boswell? By the time she entered the water, some 50 people had been splashing and yelling for more than an hour. Everybody had been, you know, in and out of the water a lot, climbing back up and jumping in. It was a pretty, pretty rowdy bunch. 300 miles from shore, these vibrations would ring out like a giant dinner bell. Yet, by all accounts, Shannon Ainsley was resting quietly on his board when he was attacked. And his paddling movements were not more extreme than any of his companions. Shannon, he does not do anything strange. He's always got the feeling for the flow of the wave. But something set Shannon apart. Something caused two great whites to target him, and him alone. What was it? Great white sharks have been known to cover thousands of miles of ocean in just a few months. How did two of them end up at the same place at exactly the same time? Some may suggest it's simply a coincidence, but new evidence points to something else entirely. Shark coming up here on the left. Research done by Michael Scholl and other biologists here seems to show that great white sharks tagged in the waters near Cape Town are actually swimming up the coast of Africa to East London at certain times of the year, namely in June and July, just when Shannon Ainsley was attacked. But what could be drawing them towards East London? There is no sea lion colony here. There are no dive boats or chumming. Something else must be the attraction. Towards the first two weeks of June, we normally have the sardine run, where huge schools of sardines move up the coast. These sardine schools are trapped in a narrow band of cold water between the warm current and the land, and they come very close inshore. There's a huge feeding frenzy going on. You can actually see it swarming over the sea. You can see the birds diving, and you see the seals and the dolphins. It's one big feeding frenzy when the sardines move past here. Basically, you've got in one place the whole food chain kind of lined up. If you've got the little, you know, the little sardines, uh, behind that, you'll have the, the bigger fish, uh, Cape Salmon, uh, tuna. And behind them, you've obviously got the big sharks following the bigger fish. So it's, it's basically a, a, a huge feast. Uh, all you can eat to be fair for, for just about every predator. And predators come from far into this area to follow the sardines. Could large numbers of white sharks also be following this movable feast? White sharks all eat just seals. I mean, they eat mainly fish. A white shark grows slowly, and it's nearly a decade before an individual is able to tackle a seal or a sea lion meal. Until then, the sharks live almost exclusively on fish, especially oily tuna, until they gain the size and experience they need to turn their attention to larger prey. The sardine run would almost certainly attract large numbers of great whites. And if the sharks follow the sardines to East London in June, what happens 
if the giant schools move on and the sharks don't. The same conditions that drive the fish onward also bring the best surf of the year to East London. And that brings even more surfers. Could the sharks be lingering offshore just as the menu is changed? July is certainly the best month for surfing in East London. Roughly two or three weeks after the sardines have been passed here. If you consider the amount of man hours that are spent in the water surfing, it is a combination that does cause problems for us during the month of July. Shannon Ainsley was attacked on July 17th. Almost without exception, shark attacks in East London take place in July. But while the sardine run might explain how more great whites can end up in East London waters, it doesn't resolve why two of the sharks would attack the same human victim at the same time. Like many apex predators, great whites are often thought to be solitary creatures. But that, it turns out, is only part of the truth. Great whites seem to have a complex social structure, one that scientists are only beginning to study. And their interactions are not always cordial. Quite often, sharks may bear scars and bite marks that can be traced to other individuals in the same region. The wounds can be minor or severe and testify to a hierarchy that seems based on competition and intimidation. Heather Boswell thinks her attack may have something to do with this kind of behavior. When it first was turned on my leg, the shark was more curious, but by the, the time it came back around and bit me again, it was, it was a lot more vicious. I don't know if it felt like it was going to lose me to the boat in the water. Maybe it, you know, it was trying to compete. Definitely felt like a different kind of a, you know, attack. Were the sharks that targeted Shannon competing in some way? Or were they cooperating? White sharks have been known to join forces when hunting and will fan out to either side of their prey, then trap it between them. They will even take turns biting 20-pound chunks out of their catch. Was this their intention with Shannon Ainsley? The tuna that may have drawn the sharks to East London typically continue on with the sardines. Were the sharks desperate for a meal? Or were they sending a message to something they regarded as a competitor for the now limited supply of prey? We can't be sure. Whatever their intent, the fact remains. Shannon Ainsley was surrounded by other surfers when he was attacked. Yet both sharks zeroed in on him, and him alone. Did something make him more attractive than the others in the water that day? Did he look different to the sharks? Great white sharks have remarkable visual abilities. They can see in color and also have what is called polarized vision. It's a feature that allows them to distinguish silvery or dark prey from the rest of the watery world. But their acute vision suffers as night approaches, forcing them to be more cautious and less active. This might explain why there are virtually no attacks on humans at night by great whites. The creatures may not hunt after dark. But the animals are designed to see extremely well during daylight hours, 
making it extremely unlikely that they confuse people with marine mammals. Yet there was nothing about Shannon or his board that distinguished him from the others. At midday, all the surfers would have been backlit by the sunlit world up above. The sharks would see only solid shapes. Shannon did not stand out visually. Something else must have drawn the sharks to him. Was it simply the luck of the draw? Some might say so, if this were the end of the story. But unbelievably, Shannon Ainsley's encounters with great white sharks were just beginning. The fact that Shannon Ainsley survived an attack from two great white sharks is simply astonishing. How did it happen? Shannon couldn't recall, but he has pieced the story back together using the only shreds of evidence that remain, the accidental video and the board he was riding. The one shark went from a board over here, and then the shark burned to the board. One ended up with a mouthful of surfboard. But what of the other? The second shark didn't get me at all. And as soon as the shark on the left-hand side bumped me into the air, the other shark sort of missed me. That may have made the difference between life and death. But I think the shark on the left-hand side sort of saved my life because if it didn't knock me into the air, the other shark would have put my head off. <laughs> It's hard enough to believe that Shannon survived this bewildering attack. But unbelievably, two years later, Shannon was targeted again while surfing another South African break. I was just sitting on my board and all of a sudden I just felt myself get picked up and my board just flung up in front of me and I fell back. I don't know how big the shark was, but it was quite a, quite a hard knock. Once again, he was singled out from all the other surfers in the water. And once again, incredibly, he received no major injuries. And while it borders on the impossible, there is evidence that there was yet another attempted attack on Shannon. There were about 40 people in the water when I paddled past this one guy, and then I turned around and about two meters away from me, I just saw the shark just going crazy and savaging the surfboard or the surfer. Fortunately, the other surfer survived the assault, but was yet another shark gunning for Shannon. I don't know why sharks are always attacking me. What is it about Shannon that sharks find so attractive? Why do they hone in on him? As they cruised along the coastline in the wake of the sardines, the pair of hunting sharks may have been drawn towards the reef because of the splashing sounds made by the group of surfers. As they got closer, however, smell would be the next sense they would perceive. And Shannon has a habit that may make his scent more attractive to a shark. I was just wondering, what do you do out there when you have to go pee? Well, I, I, I normally just wee in my way to there. Urine, like blood, is filled with agents that are easily detected by the shark's highly developed sense of smell. The fact that Shannon relieves himself while surfing doesn't distinguish him from other surfers. It's the number of times he does so. I just wee like five times in the surf. Shannon urinates repeatedly while he's in the water, increasing the odds that a shark might smell him. Could this greater concentration of bodily fluid have led the sharks to hone in on Shannon again and again? We can't be sure. But sharks do possess one other sense in their arsenal that may cause them to lock on Shannon. It's an extraordinary power. 
and one that's completely invisible to us. Look at that. You can see these little pores here. These are the ampullae of Lorenzini. Those allow them to uh, sense electromagnetic signals. Pretty amazing. Sharks, including great whites, have special sensors that can detect minute changes in electrical fields. This video was shot by a scientist who studies their electrical sensitivity. Buried under the sand, in the leftmost circle is a weak battery, and the shark zeroes in on it immediately. Corroding metal also emits an electrical charge, which may help explain why sharks sometimes bite the safety cages of divers. Their interest may be in the cage itself, not in its contents. The small canals, or ampullae, are so sensitive, they can even detect the electrical charges of an animal's nervous system, or its beating heart, inside the body of their prey, like some deadly EKG machine. So do all living things give off electrical signals? Yes, absolutely. A human's electrical field is easily strong enough for a shark to detect. You think uh, certain people may be more interesting to sharks than others? I think the answer is probably yes. It is quite possible that some people maybe are uh, more prone to being attacked by sharks. It makes you wonder if people give off uh, different electromagnetic signals that are more attractive to sharks. Some scientists believe electromagnetism is the final sense a shark employs as it hones in on its prey. A great white shark rolls its eyes back in its head to protect them as it strikes its victim. But its sixth sense ensures that it never goes blind. Electromagnetism directs the bite of its awesome jaws. Could Shannon's electrical field, his aura, account for his strange attractiveness to the great predators? We may never know. Shannon, at least, is sure of one thing. He'll keep surfing regardless of whether his attractiveness is simply a statistical anomaly or the result of something we still don't fully understand. It's such a good feeling to just feel the water underneath your surfboard and just to ride the wave then just be, be free. And there are some things we can be sure of. Though the annual number of shark attacks has risen steadily over the past century, so has the number of people who are spending time in the predator's watery world. Precisely what causes any of these awesome creatures to attack us may always be a matter of speculation. But the numbers prove that encounters are rare. Every year, a few unfortunate people lose their lives to sharks worldwide. In the same period, millions of sharks of all species are killed by us. Any instance of shark attack is much more the exception than the rule. If there was an attack each time a shark saw you, there would be a hundred, or a thousand attacks a day, uh, and that just doesn't occur. Though attacks are rare, when they do occur, they can be devastating. These awesome predators have ruled the seas for 200 million years. We are but newcomers to their liquid world. Whenever we enter it, it should come as no surprise that these supreme creatures will remain the hunters. And we 